in Ephesians 4, God says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers for the building up of the church, for the equipping of the church for works of service, so that they would be uh, come to the fullness of knowledge in Christ and become mature. And I want this church, and I believe God wants this church and all of his churches to be a church full of mature believers, full of mature followers. And I think it's really important that we, um, when we go after that, we talk about these difficult things, these things that are real to our lives. And I really do believe that if we talk about this subject and we do it well and we, and we wrestle with these difficult things, we can become a mature church who is able to carry out those works of service in every season that we face. Not just the easy ones, but the difficult ones as well. And so there's a risk, I think, if we don't talk about these kinds of subjects and we kind of skirt around these difficult ones and we go after maybe the low-hanging fruit, there's a risk sometimes that when we face those times in our lives where we encounter suffering, and let's not kid ourselves, we all either have or will or are right now in a moment of suffering. And in fact, I think you could be, uh, you could even go so far as to say, you know, at any period in time, all of us are encountering some level of suffering in our lives. A lot of the time, it will be almost um, so unnoticeable that we don't notice it. But sometimes it can be almost unbearable. So it's important that we discuss this and that we understand it properly so that even in those moments where we are suffering really, really badly, we can still have faith in God, not be tossed about to and fro on the waves or um, have our faith challenged by those moments, but so that we can stand mature, knowing that what is happening in those moments is working something in us that God can use to bring his glory and his name uh, fame in this land as well. So I just want to pray again as we approach this subject and just um, pray that God would help us just navigate these next few minutes together well. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We thank you, Father, for your word to us. Lord, and we thank you for this opportunity to discuss this subject this morning. Lord, we pray for your wisdom and your clarity this morning, Lord. I pray for our, our eyes and our hearts to be open to receive from you, Lord, that you would impart to us, Lord, a greater understanding of this subject, Lord, that we would see you in it, Lord, and that we would receive a greater revelation of your love through what we talk about this morning, Lord. We bless this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I really do want to try and navigate this time well because there is a lot to talk about. And um, I want to talk really with, just begin with why we can expect to experience periods of suffering in our lives. And I think that's important because there are parts of the Christian community that would try to tell you that as a Christian, all you should expect is health, wealth, and prosperity. And I, uh, I really am not okay with that kind of thinking because it leads you into a place that is dangerous and it can leave you disillusioned when you find the reality of life bite. And Jesus said, didn't say, in this world you will have money. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. But he did say, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. So take heart this morning, even though this is a tricky subject, it is an encouraging one, and there is uh, things for us to pick up this morning which I hope will encourage you as you either navigate a moment of suffering that you're in right now, or come out of one, or walk into one. So, I don't think God wants us to minimize this subject at all. I don't think he wants us to deny it. I think he wants us to be up front and to talk about it. And I think it helps us first to understand just why, what are the reasons why we should expect suffering in our lives. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know this. And he crafted the earth and he crafted the mountains and the valleys and the plants and the trees. And he filled the waters with fish and the land with animals and the skies with birds. And then he crowned his creation and he capped it all off by creating man and woman in his image and in his likeness. And God gave them a mission to go into all of creation, to be fruitful and multiply, and to fill his creation with his image. But you see, when sin entered the world, through the choice of that man and woman, 
to rebel against what God has said, the image that they carried was marred and distorted. And the relationship that they experienced with God, where they dwelled in his presence, was severed by the presence of sin that now dwelled in them. And without that relationship, because and because their image was distorted and marred, they were unable to carry out that mission of filling creation with the image of God. And the result was that the consequences of their rebellion not only affected them, but it affected all of creation as well. Now, alongside this rebellion that happens on earth, there's another rebellion that happens in heaven, where some of God's heavenly creatures also rebel against him and decide that they want to try and do life without him as well. And these two rebellions, they overlap and they intermingle, and earth becomes a place that's kind of under, largely under the dominion of hostile spiritual forces hostile to God and full of people who are hostile to God. And God would have been fully justified in wiping the whole thing out. He would have had every right to do that. But God is a father and he has the heart of a father. The Bible tells us that even when we're faithless, he is faithful. And so God puts into plan a plan of action that's going to not only redeem his creation, not only redeem his people, but also renew them as well. And at the center of this plan stands Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who the Bible tells us is the image of the invisible God and the exact representation of his nature. And God sends his Son to do something that nobody else could. Through his obedience to the death on a cross, where Jesus suffered more than anyone else has. And I'm not just talking physically, because you might be able to make an argument that other people have experienced more physical pain than he did on the cross there. But in bearing the weight of the sin of all humanity, as the wrath of God was poured out and exhausted upon him, he suffered more than anybody else ever has or will. And in that moment, he experienced a separation from God that he'd never known before. So there is nobody who has even come close to suffering as Jesus suffered in that time and in that moment. But through that suffering, he created the path, the only path back to relationship with God and back to the restoration of the true image of God in the people of God. And the prophet Isaiah, he wrote about this in his writings. And he wrote hundreds of years before Jesus roamed the earth. And he wrote about Jesus and he identified him as the suffering servant. And he gives this prophetic testimony of Jesus saying something telling us about what's going to happen to him as he suffers. And he writes this, he says, His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. And I think the distortion of Jesus' physical image was a mirror for the distortion and disfiguring of humanity's spiritual image. But he suffered that disfigurement and that distortion and that marring and that painful death and that execution so that through that suffering, we would be restored to the original image of the Father's design. He became a broken image of humanity physically so we could become a restored image of God spiritually. And I think that is the process that Paul talks about in his letter to the Corinthians when he says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, Christ crucified for us, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So here is where we are today, church. That's the context. Here's where we are today. We live in a broken world. We live in a world that is full of broken people, and we've been born again into the middle of a spiritual war that is raging all around us. And in the middle of all of that, we are being transformed into the restored image of God through the power of the Holy Spirit at work inside of us. And as the restored image of God, we are actively participating in the activity of God that is seeing the kingdom of heaven advance into the kingdom's world 
of the world. And, you know, the only problem with that is that there is an enemy out there who doesn't want to let go of the grip that he has held over this earth and over these people. And so in his resistance to God's kingdom, he will often seek to attack the ambassadors of God's kingdom, the church. And in his effort to frustrate the purposes of God, it can often lead to suffering in our lives. So in summary, we can expect, I think, broadly to experience suffering in life because of these three things. We live in a broken world. We live inside of a broken creation which leads to all kinds of natural disasters, the things we see all around us, earthquakes and volcanoes and those kinds of things. And that broken world is filled with broken people who are naturally bent towards sinful behaviors and who make bad decisions about all kinds of things. And and amongst all of that, there are spiritual agents at work who want to see God's agenda derailed. And all of that amounts to an environment where we should expect and do experience suffering and persecution. Now, all of those things, I think, they can intermingle and they can overlap. And something that on the surface may present itself as a physical, uh, natural um, thing that's causing us to suffer can, in fact, have a spiritual root cause. And sometimes... The other, the other, other way around is true as well. Something that we think can have a spiritual cause, and I think sometimes in, a, in our sort of charismatic Pentecostal uh, circles, we can sometimes lean this way a bit too much. We can think sometimes um, those things that have a spiritual cause, they're actually just being caused by our bad decisions or our sinful behavior. And so as a church, we need the wisdom to discern the difference because it will determine the way we do our warfare. So we need that wisdom, and we could talk on that. That's a whole other subject as well, but um, uh, I would love someone else to pick up the baton and run with that one. So all of this being said, we might legitimately look at the world around us, all the brokenness that we see, and the people in it who are broken, and the, the effects of that spiritual war raging all around us. We might look at all of that and see and say, God, what are you doing here? What on earth are you doing here, God? Why are you allowing these things to happen? Why can't you fix all of these things? Surely you have the power to do something about this. And the answer is yes, and he will, and he is. And I think God's first answer to that is the church. Is the church. You know, there's a reason you're still here. Because if it was all about you just going to heaven, if it was all about us just getting back to that place of relationship as individuals, then God could have taken us the moment that we surrendered our lives to him. But he's left us here because there's work to be done. And there's work to be done in us and through us as well. But James has already mentioned this morning that God's plan to redeem and renew creation all ends with the end of suffering. It all ends with the end of suffering. So God's ultimate plan is to bring us into a place where we no longer suffer. So you can say that God is doing something about it because the ultimate outworking of his renewed creation is this passage in Revelation 21, verses 3 to 4, where it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. In the, col- in the culmination of God's plan for renewal, there is no more suffering. It's done, it's kaput. But do you see, to get us to that place, it took Christ suffering on the cross. The only route to that place where creation could be renewed and suffering could be done away with, went straight through the cross. There's a weird kind of paradox at work there. And I, I, I want you to be encouraged with this this morning. You know, God's plan for renewal is not some far-off place in the future. Yes, it finds its ultimate fulfillment there in our experience, but it's already begun. It's already begun. 
God's plan for renewal has already begun. It began when Jesus died, when he was buried, and when he rose again three days later. It's not complete yet, but it's already underway. And it's underway in the risen Jesus, who's now enthroned in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, and is ruling and reigning with all authority given to him. And it's underway in the church. It's underway in the people of God who are at the same time already restored and also in the process of being transformed into the image of God. But you know, on the road to God making all things new and removing the old order of things, there is a role, I believe, that suffering plays in that. Paul writes about this, I think, in Romans 8, where he says this. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation waits sorry, that was repeated. Uh, for the children were subject for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. You see, there's a paradox at work there. It's in that same way that God opens the door for the renewal of all creation, which ultimately does away with suffering through Jesus' suffering on the cross. So too is it in that revealing of our identity as sons of God, through a suffering that will ultimately bring the whole of creation into liberation. And I know that's probably gone over the heads of some of the people here this morning. Maybe it's gone over the heads of you online. It's probably gone over my head a little bit. And I've had my head in this for quite a long time in preparation. But that's kind of what a paradox does. But I hope that you're kind of seeing this pattern here. And you know, something that I don't think helps us when we approach this subject as the church is this um, modern Western mindset that's kind of infiltrated and overridden much of our attempts in the church to think biblically about these kinds of subjects. And I think we've developed in the West, particularly, this misconception that the highest good there is out there is the alleviation and the avoidance of suffering. And you see that worked out in all of the things that we do, even in the technology that we develop. The fact that we create things to shortcut processes that previously caused us to suffer. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Please don't mishear me on that. I am grateful for those things. I am grateful for those people who work diligently in those fields, technology, medicine, those kinds of areas. But I don't think it's the highest good possible. And I think it's a misconception that's kind of crept into the church that's taught us to think and feel in certain ways about these kinds of things. And sometimes if you carry around that misconception, when you encounter suffering in your life, and you will, when you encounter those things and you don't see it shift, it can cause you to kind of question what God is doing in that moment. It might even cause you to question if God is even real because you're coming at it with this misconception, this mindset that isn't biblical, but it's earthly. And I don't, want to, um, I don't want to dismiss your feelings this morning, you know, because when we, when we encounter these things, when we suffer and we can suffer, or even when we just turn on our TV screens and we see the suffering that's occurring all around us, all over the world, it can be really difficult. And it makes us want to say, God, where are you? But we have to approach that carefully. Because we are not God's judge. It is not up to us to judge God. But do you know what? That is a legitimate cry. God, where are you in these things? God, where are you in this moment? I mean, if you've read the Psalms, that's what half of the Psalms, if you read the book of Job, it's the book of Job. God inspired that scripture. He inspired somebody to write it. It's legitimate to make that cry. You know what's not legitimate? to say, God, where are you in this, and then turn your back on him. That's illegitimate. God doesn't want us to not cry out to him in the face of suffering. In fact, he wants his church to rise up and intercede in the face of suffering, but we do it when we run to God, not away from him. 
Suffering should cause us to run to the son of suffering, not away from the son of suffering. So that should drive us in his arms, not out from them. So if you are in that moment, if you're experiencing something, if you're wrestling with something, and maybe it's a lifelong thing that you are working through, that you will have to carry for the rest of your life, don't run away from God. If you're opening up your lungs to cry out, God, where are you? I want to encourage you to continue to do that, but run towards him, not away from him in that. And you know there's a role for the church to play in all of that. I don't have time to go into it today, but Paul calls us a body. And he says, when one part of the body suffers, all the body suffers. And you know, if you're part of this church this morning, and there, nobody is aware of the suffering that you're experiencing, I want to encourage you to go and share it with somebody. You can come and share it with me, if you like, or James, or maybe one of your close friends here at church. Because if the, somebody in the church is suffering, and it's not affecting us in some way, that's pointing to a connection issue. Just in the same way that if I break my toe and I don't realize it, that's pointing to an issue in my nervous system. We don't want that to happen. So if you are suffering, if you're in that moment, please do not suffer silently or by yourself. God has put us together as a family for a reason. Let's make sure that we are treating one another with that same mindset. And as I said, God's ultimate plan includes the complete and utter eradication of suffering for his people. But in the here and now, I do believe that it's possible that our pain and suffering, in that pain and suffering, there can be a greater good that God is working in us and through us that might not include the immediate alleviation of suffering because it will include the eternal alleviation of suffering. And to illustrate that, I want to look at the Apostle Paul's example. I don't think there's anybody better in the Bible to turn to, apart from possibly Job. But uh, Paul, I want to take this morning. And, and Paul's apostolic commissioning is quite unique. It's not the kind of commissioning prayer that we pray today. This is what God said to Ananias, who was the man he sent to baptize Paul. He said, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. James is thinking he's so glad that we didn't pray that over him as we commissioned him into the role of lead pastor here at church. But that's what God said to Paul. He said, go, I'm going to show you how much you must suffer for my name. And if you read through the book of Acts, you get this picture of all of the different ways that Paul was persecuted and all the different ways that he suffered. I think he suffered just by the fact that he was called to be a missionary in a day where there were no planes, where there were no cars, and he had to walk from place to place or ride on donkeys. I mean, that was enough. But all the other things he suffered, you can read about them in, in 2 Corinthians 11. This whole long list of things that he suffered it wasn't even a complete list because he wasn't, you know, he had more of his journey to go at that time. And do you know what? Paul it wasn't like he, he did it for 30 or 40 years. It wasn't like he just, you know, he, he did it and he worked hard and he suffered hard and then he kicked back for 20 years and enjoyed the fruits of his labor in a lovely retirement where he could go around, the, uh, go around the Mediterranean revisiting all of his old friends and whining and dining. Paul suffered every day of his life up until the moment that the sword severed his head from his neck. Yes. He suffered and yet what fruit he bore. Yeah. What fruit he bore. And do you know the beautiful thing is that Paul's not suffering anymore. He is enjoying the fruit of that labor. Well done, good and faithful servant. But there's one particular part of his journey and one particular part of his writings that I want to focus on because I think it illustrates just what a greater good can be worked through a process of suffering in us. And if you keep reading on from that account in um, 2 Corinthians 11 where he tells us about all of his sufferings and into chapter 12, you get this um, place where Paul, he goes for a visit to heaven and he saw things that were amazing and he wasn't allowed to, to speak about them. He says it's unlawful, which almost always kind of makes me fall on the skeptical side. You know, when you hear those stories of people that I went to heaven and I visited this place and God showed me that, I would approach those things cautiously if I were you, but I'm getting way off point. Anyway, this is what he says, 2 Corinthians uh, 12, verse 7. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me, for the sake of Christ, 
then I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So I just want to go through this passage that we just read and unpack it a little bit because I think there's so much in this for us as we just walk through seasons where we suffer or we walk out of them or we walk into them or we walk with others who are in those moments. And firstly, Paul writes about this thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what this is. There's um, conjecture, speculation, speculation and uh, debate about whether it was his ongoing persecutions that he suffered. Maybe it was a, a mental affliction, maybe the mental strain of caring for the churches that he planted in that hostile environment. Or maybe it was a physical difficulty. Personally, that's the way I lean. I lean more towards it being a physical condition. I think maybe it had something to do with his eyesight. Uh, Paul talks about in his letters about uh, when he signs them off at the end, he, see, he says, see what large letters I write in clue perhaps to the fact that he suffered with his eyes and I think that maybe came about through uh, an experience that he had in a place called Lystra where he was stoned he was taken out places out, out the back and he was stoned but God miraculously kind of brought him through that experience uh, which I also happen to think was perhaps maybe the moment he had his caught up to heaven experience um, and Paul says he was given this fawn in the flesh so we might well ask the question well who gave it to him who gave it to him? And I think actually Paul answers the question for us in the passage where he says it is a messenger of Satan. And if you think perhaps like I do that the affliction came about through that stoning that was intended to take his life, you could see how uh, a lasting effect from that could be seen as a messenger from Satan sent to a sent to torment him, sent to try and knock him off course, sent to try and make him ineffective. And what's interesting about all of that is that Paul says he asked God to take it away three times. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. As I said, Paul doesn't suffer from that condition anymore. Paul doesn't suffer from any conditions anymore. So eventually, God did take it away. But while he was on the earth... He was something that he continued to suffer from for the rest of his life. And here where Paul asks God to take it away three times, God says no. God says no. That means that there are times when you can ask God to remove something that is causing you to suffer, even something that's been sent direct from the enemy, and it's legitimate for God to say no. That's a challenge, isn't it? Stick with me. Stick with me because I want to, I want to unpack that. Because God doesn't say no to those kinds of things because he's sadistic. He doesn't say no to those kinds of things because he enjoys watching us suffer. But he says no to it because as Paul would go on to write in his letter to the Romans, we know that for those who love God... God works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. So Paul, I think, recognizes this in that situation. Because after three times, he stops praying for God to take it away. And even though he identifies the thorn in his flesh as a messenger of Satan, he also says that it was given to me to stop me being conceited. I think what Paul is recognizing is that even one even what the enemy intended for evil, even what may have come about through an attempt on his life, God can take it and turn it for the good. Paul is recognizing that God did not remove the thorn in his flesh because it was forcing Paul to pull on more of God's strength and less of his own. It was keeping him from becoming conceited. In other words, the suffering that he was experiencing through this thorn, whatever it was, was causing him to persevere in his dependence on God and not in his own strength. And that was keeping his character from becoming conceited, given the extreme revelations that he'd received. And when, we, when he saw all of that, I think he looked differently at the suffering caused through this thorn. And he looked at it with a new hope because he began to understand that when you are in a position of weaknesses, weakness that 
forces you to rely on the strength of God and not on your own. It produces a strength and a resilience inside of you that you would never get otherwise. And we might be tempted to say that if God loves us, that he'd remove everything Satan puts in our lives to try and take it, to try and take us out or to make us more ineffective. But here, instead of removing the problem, God calls Paul into a deeper experience of the reality of his grace. And he uses the very thing that Satan sent to frustrate him to extend that invitation into a deeper knowledge of the power of the grace that he has towards Paul. And Paul accepts that invitation and it makes him an even more potent minister for the kingdom. Paul writes again in Romans 5, he says this, he says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, sometimes there is a greater good than alleviating suffering. Sometimes suffering can be used by God in the process of revealing Christ in you, in the process of revealing the sons and daughters that he's called. We know that for all those who love God, all things work together for his good, for their good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Sometimes, most times, all things mentioned in that passage are not things we want. But it doesn't mean they're not beneficial for the work that God is doing in us and through us. And sometimes the only route to the good that God is bringing lies through the path of suffering that calls us into the deeper, endless oceans of his amazing grace. And it's so important that we understand that. It sets the context for how we walk through those moments of suffering. You know, in the book of Hebrews, the writer exhorts us over and over and over again to persevere, to keep going, to not give up. Even when we're faced with sufferings and persecutions and hardships, to keep holding on to God. In fact, the author writes this. In chapter 10, he says, But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Don't turn your back on God when it gets hard, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet in a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and, and preserve their souls. Keep going, even when it's tough. Even when, it's, even when you're suffering, keep going. And when you see somebody suffering around you, get around them and make sure you help them to keep going. I was reminded of that picture. I saw it this morning in the video. Johnny Brownlee coming up to finish the triathlon. And his legs are like jelly and he's wobbling and he can't make it. He's 500 meters from the finish. And his brother comes alongside him and hauls him over the finish line. Brothers, sisters, get around one another and let's haul one another over the finish line when it gets tough. And then the author goes on. He writes a whole chapter on this. He goes on to give example after example after example of the men and women who went before us, the men and women of the Old Testament who didn't even have the promises that we have, who didn't even see the things that we've seen. And he talks about the horrendous situations that they lived in, they lived through. He talks about the horrendous persecutions they, suffering, they suffered. And he said that they kept going. They kept living by faith. And then in chapter 12, he sums it all up and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He tells us Jesus 
endured the cross. He endured the shame. He endured the pain. He endured the torment and the mocking and the separation. And he did it for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? What was the joy set before him? It was the redemption and the renewal of all of creation. It was especially the redemption and the renewal of the church that he promised to build. And it was the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. It was Christ in you, the hope of glory, that took him through the cross. But all of it lay on the other side of suffering. And the only way to see it happen was through the cross. So I'm going to invite the band to come back and we'll try and just wrap up here. I know there's so much more we could talk about this morning, but we just don't have time. But God's plan for renewal is already underway. It's already underway. And one day the final curtain on that plan will fall and the renewal will be complete. And in that moment, all of the suffering that we now experience, all the suffering we have experienced, all of the pain, the heartache, the loss, the mourning that we walk through, all of it will be done away for good. And all of those who in this life have chosen to put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ and have received the free gift of salvation on offer in him will not have to worry anymore about pain or suffering or any of those things. But you know, for everyone who doesn't make that choice or who hasn't made that choice yet, there is a different eternity awaiting them. So while we might say as the church, Lord, hasten the day of your swift return. Fulfill that promise. The reality is that when that day comes... For many, it's not going to be as welcome as it is for us. So for right now, while we may long for the very real and the hard and the difficult sufferings we have or will or are experiencing to end, the truth is that sometimes what's being produced in us and through us as a product of suffering is worth the difficulty of the journey. I want to share with you two more scriptures before we close this morning and we'll pray after we close. Firstly is Paul writing in Philippians 3. And I want you to see what he's saying in this passage. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. You know, there's something in suffering that as we walk that road with God produces in us an intimacy with him that we would never be able to experience without that suffering. There's an intimacy of a knowing of Christ that is so surpassing in its worth, meaning it's more valuable than anything else we could ever gain. And there, the route to that intimacy involves taking up our cross and following him. It means to participate in what he, the suffering servant, experienced. And as we do that, what's produced inside of us, the image that we're transformed into from one degree of glory from another, helps us to better minister to the world around us that may be heading in a different direction. One day every tear will be dried, all sufferings will cease, pain will end. Will not mourn because death will be no more, but until that day, his grace is sufficient for us. Whether that grace extends to lifting us out of that suffering through a miraculous work of his healing or deliverance, or whether his grace extends to carrying us through, it is sufficient. And as we learn to lean into that grace, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. 
none of it is meaningless. None of it is empty. None of the things that we go through, none of the sufferings that we experience, none of the pain that we feel is without purpose. God can use it all, all of it, in his plan. We don't understand it sometimes. So we cry out to God, not run away from him. I want to leave you with this scripture and then I'm going to pray for you. Take heart from this. Let it speak to your soul if you're in that moment of suffering. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, not from us. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed. Sometimes we don't understand, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but he's with us in that. We're not abandoned. We're struck down, but he will rise us up. We're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Father God, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your spirit in us. We thank you for the church that you have placed us in. Father God, we thank you that you work all things for the good of those who are called according to your purposes and who love you. Father, I pray for every single person here, present physically in the building, watching online live or back later. Lord, that you would pull them into a greater experience of you. That you would draw them close. That they would know the surpassing worth of knowing you. Lord, that in these times where we face hardship and trouble, and persecution, and strife, and difficulty, and pain, and anguish, and loss, that in those moments we would fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. That we would fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And that that faith would grow strong in us, Lord, to persevere in those moments. That you would produce inside of us the character, Lord, that mimics Christ. Lord, that you would fill us with a spirit of hope even in those difficult times because we know, Lord, that you are revealing in us the image of your Son. You are transforming us from one degree of glory to another so that we might display your glory, not ours, to the entire creation and call many sons and daughters of God home to you. Lord, bless every single one of your precious sons and daughters in this place this, evening, this morning. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.